Psalms 84 is where we'll spend our time. Uh, this passage of scripture, I think I have uh, the message translation uh, as the passage that will par particularly be on the screen. Uh, I'll say that Psalms 84 is a part of the, the biblical text. It is the, the part of the what is known as the Hebrew scriptures, the, uh, the text that the earliest Jewish in Israel and Hebrew uh, uh, culture and peoples used. Uh, you know, when you read the book of Psalms, Psalms is uh, often described by uh, one of my wonderful friends and mentor preachers as uh, experience in search of theology, which is just to say that sometimes you have an experience and you don't always have theological language for it. You don't always have the ability to describe where God is inside your experience starting off. But the more you live, you start to realize that God is active and at work among all of the things that concern us. God is active and at work among all of the things that are of the ultimate concern. And so sometimes we can have moments in our lives where we are often uh, sure theology in search of experience. We start with this faith and we know that I'm living my life out according to my faith, theology and surgery experience. But sometimes, how many know there are some experiences that you go through that you do not yet have theological language for? It's like, God, what are you up to? Anybody ever ask God, what are you up to, God? Well, these are uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, collections of uh, scriptures that remind us that God was constantly revealing God's self to a people who were trying to understand God, where are you? Psalms 84 is one of these uh, songs, if you will, that they sang and chanted as they made their annual pilgrimage to the temple. And uh, it reminds us that life is quite a journey. And I'm glad that God gives us some language to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness along the way. And here it is, we find uh, several millennia, if you will, worth of language to help us make it through some dry places. And that is what we'll talk a little bit about today in Psalms 84. Verse number one, I believe you can hopefully follow it on the screen. The scripture says this, how lovely is your temple. Your dwelling place on earth, O eternal one, commander of heaven's armies, how I long to be there. My soul is spent, wanting, waiting to walk in the courts of the eternal. My whole being sings joyfully to the living God, just as the sparrow seeks her home and the swallow finds in her own nest a place to lay her young. I, too, seek your altars, my king, and my God, commander of heaven's armies. Verse number four, how blessed, somebody say blessed, how blessed are those who make your house their home. Mm -hmm. How blessed are those who make your house their home, who live with you. They are constantly praising you. Blessed are those who make you their strength for their treasure, for they treasure every step of the journey to Zion. Mm. And on their way through the valley of Baca, they stop and dig wells to collect the refreshing spring water and the early rains fill the pools. They journey from place to place, gaining strength along the way until they meet God in Zion. Uh, somebody say, God wants to meet up with you. Amen. Uh, verse number eight, I believe. Oh, eternal God, commander of heaven's army, listen to my prayer. Oh, please listen, God of Jacob. Oh, true God, look at our shield, our protector. See the face of your anointed king and defend our defender. Just one day in the courts of your temple is greater than a thousand anywhere else. Listen to this. I would rather serve as a porter. Other versions say a doorman, uh, a usher 
at my God's doorstep than live in luxury in the house of the wicked. Amen. I don't know about you, amen, but that's quite a claim. Man, I'd rather hang out in the doors, guarding in God's house than hang out with the wicked in a luxury space. Verse number 11, for the eternal God is a sun and a shield. The eternal grants favor and glory. God doesn't deny any good thing to those who live with integrity. O eternal one, commander of heaven's army, how fortunate are those who trust you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So uh, talking about how to get through the desert places, uh, the title of this sermon today <coughs> will be Make It a Well. Make it a well. God bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy and may it rest on me and even the hearers of your word and we'll say thank you God in Jesus name we pray that the people of God say amen if someone asks you how do you get through hard times how do you get through the desert you ought to look at your neighbor and tell them make it a well tell them that make it a well make it a well one of the hardest things for a child of God to do is to find the sacred in the profane to find uh joy in the midst of grief, to find light in the midst of gloom. And yet we who are aware of hope and of salvation and of God's activity in our lives constantly wrestle with this reality that God's promises, God's finality is an already but not yet phenomenon. Which is just as to say that God has finalized the joy, the peace, the goodness, and dare I say, the salvation of all creation. Already in God's work and in God's activity, God has made it clear that in the end, all will be reconciled. And yet, just like you've seen so many movies, how many have watched the movie over and over and over again to the point where you can uh, uh, predict what someone's about to say because you've memorized the lines? Mm -hmm. I've watched Good Times, the show from the eight. Is it? The, it had to be the eighties, I think. Maybe it was the seventies. I'm just older. Uh, but I've memorized shows like Good Times and The Cosby Show. I've memorized movies like Friday and The Five Heartbeats and The Godfather. And I can watch it and get lots of exhilaration out of the process of rewatching it. But I do know how the ending is going to be. But I want you to know that you serve a God that knows how your ending is going to be. And God is with us. God is walking with us. God is talking with us. God is leading us by the hand. And yet there is a reality that in our humanity, even though God knows what the end is going to be, we don't. And going through life with an open-ended journey that seems to suggest that Life is not fair, that the ending may not result in what we want, can create lots of consternation and lots of anxiety. But I want you to know, beloved, that one of our most important gifts of the faith is this confidence in knowing that as I journey, God, who knows the end from the beginning, is journeying with me. You and I are not alone. You got to pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm not alone. And, 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 and although it may feel at times that I am lonely, how many of you can confess I still am not alone? Amen. And part of the journey we make is to uh, help us realize that with the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs, the, as, as, as the, the urban prophet says, whether good or bad, happy or sad, we ought to what? Stay together. We ought to push through. We ought to 
stay the course. And I'm thankful for a psalm like this in this specific season because it forces us to remember the power of process. The power of process, the power of journey. At times, we can be overly preoccupied with our destination and less conscious of the fact that it is the journey that actually creates the version of you that can handle any destination. I want to always have a destination that is victorious, believe me. I want to walk down every road and end up in the promised land. I want to walk down every road and end up with a prize. But how many of you know that uh, real life does not offer participation trophies to every single person? I want you to understand what I'm saying. I know some of us have grown up in an era where you think just trying is good enough. How many know you can try your best and still lose? How many know you can give your best effort and still come up short? How many know you can be in relationships, partnerships, whether they're business, familial, romantic, and bring your best self to the table and still end up hurt? It is not always the destination that gives you and I the ultimate payoff. Sometimes you got to learn how to find joy in the journey. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to learn how to find lessons along the way. And even when you get to the end of the journey, whether you win or lose, sometimes you have to be able to just store the win or the loss in your back pocket and keep moving forward. And it is in this way that I believe the older saints, when they used to say things like, if God never does another thing for me, he's already done enough. Because I believe they figured out a way to find joy in the midst of their journey. It is not to suggest that along with the joy, you won't also have to deal with grief. I wrote a bit of a reflection that may get published this week uh, in one of our articles. It was a reflection on the Democratic National Convention. Many of you know that I ended up spending uh, the week there last week with some of our national uh, black church leaders and so many others uh, as we uh, called uh, to account and to organizing some issues that we think will make the quality of our lives better. But while I was there, I also had to spend some time in some tough contested spaces. And so I wrote this reflection. I'm going to read it uh, just as a part of my sermon before I jump into uh, the biblical text, because I do believe uh, that this perhaps will give some uh, insight onto uh, why I think this passage of Scripture can be blessings for us. Romans 12, 15, I referred to in my reflection, says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. The sacred text from the Christian scriptures, this sacred text from the Christian scriptures was read and preached often in my black church tradition. It taught me from an early age the virtues of compassion, empathy, mutuality, and solidarity. As a pastor and organizer and leader, one of the largest faith-based networks in the country, it is not lost on me that black churches in general and black people in particular are often asked to rejoice and weep for so many, while very few feel compelled to reciprocate that to our experience. Nevertheless, as we leave the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, this sacred admonition, admonition rejoice with those who rejoice, Weep with those who weep remains an invitation for all who live between the world as it is and the world we seek to see. The rejoicing on display this week for many of us was authentic and necessary as the ascent of Vice President Kamala Harris and her acceptance of the nomination of the Democratic Party as its presidential candidate, the first black woman, this is worthy of celebration. 
The activism of trailblazers like Fannie Lou Hamer and Shirley Chisholm provided the foundation upon which this moment was built. The past 40 years of political organizing and labor inside the Democratic Party ignited by Reverend Jesse Jackson and his 1984 and 1988 presidential campaigns cannot be underestimated. The perpetual stewardship and expansion of this legacy by brilliant black women like Mignon Moore, Donna Brazil, Regina Thomas, and Bishop Leah Daughtry should never be trivialized or erased as reasons for rejoicing in this moment is for real necessary. All of this and more is what compelled so many of us who are lifelong organizers, freedom fighters, activists, and dreamers of a future not yet realized to show up and join the joyful convention curated by some of the same brilliant black women mentioned above. And at the same time, many of us wept along with the weeping that was on display this week. The active genocide of Palestinian loved ones happening in Gaza in real time supercharged by 10 months of billions of tax dollars, unencumbered by the Leahy Amendment and international human rights laws are causes for weeping. The quiet but very loud removing of the death penalty from the DNC platform and the omission of black and brown led community violence interventions from the gun violence prevention platform promoted from the stage this week are reasons to weep. There are many other examples of issues, some which were made more central as we leave Chicago, expected to return to our communities and encourage our communities to vote Kamala Harris to be our next president and reject the political movement of Donald Trump and MAGA, hopefully for the last time in this voting generation. Listen to this, rejoicing and weeping are needed to hold intention the shared humanity we must not lose along the way to liberation. Whether the progress we achieve is incremental or transient, which just means a quantum leap forward, rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep is always a sacred and principled call to belongingness. We are not naive or simple-minded enough to expect we will get everything we desire every time we organize or make a demand to those in power, but we do believe that building moral power and mutual coalitions along the way makes all the hardness of our work bearable, particularly when we fall short on the road to liberation. <clears throat> to be sure, there is joy to be found among the ugliness of our world and our sacred work. We need to find that joy, embrace it, and dance amidst it. Similarly, there is grief to sit with amidst the ebullience of progress we experience. We need to name that grief, hold each other through it, and emerge with a renewed spirit to never give up or lose hope. I recall one of the many Palestinian young people I interacted with this week who asked me, why isn't our civil disobedience and calls for justice not working? I assured him, my friend, it is working. You have moved more to your moral cause than you can imagine. And this movement is what will secure an eventual ceasefire. As Dr. King says, the arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice step by step, tactic by tactic, demand by demand, between every laugh and cry, we bend the arc together. So I extend this invitation to all who are willing to accept it. Resist the urge to sit in anger and paralysis at the missed opportunities of the past week Weep when you must, but don't ignore the joy that is set before us. Lean into this joy when you must, however often you can. For we will need both weeping and joy to secure ceasefires in Gaza. To secure, as President, Vice President Kamala Harris proclaimed, the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. We will need both joy and weeping to end gun violence in our communities. 
to defeat Trump and to elect Kamala Harris. This is the essence of rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep, drinking from a shared cup of progress and setbacks, hope and disappointment, success and failure. May we march on and don't get weary, rejoicing and weeping until the victory is won. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It is indeed the left foot and the right foot of what it means to be in relationship with another human being. Because how many of you can attest that there are times in your life where you may be rejoicing and your neighbor or your partner is weeping? There may be times in your life where you may be weeping and your colleague or comrade is rejoicing. What does it mean to be in solidarity with one another as we go through the journey of life and ensure that my experience need not be an erasure of anyone else's? But as we walk together, to the valley of a place named Baca, we can always find in the midst of desert spaces enough water to make it through to the other side. That this is what we are being asked as followers of Jesus in this moment is to turn your desert places into wells to turn your dry places into springs of life and to ensure that when you get to a desert place that you are always mindful of who is there with you as well. Because there is never a time, beloved, where you will find yourself isolated and alone on this journey. God is inviting you and I. When you go through a desert season, Make it a well. How many of you know that one of the first ways that you make your desert places a well is you have to dig as you go? Lord, have mercy. That's my first point. Dig as you go. Verse number six says, and on their way through the valley of Baca, they stopped and dug wells. Oh, Lord, I want you to know, child of God, that part of your journey through the valley is going to require you to have some 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 tools and 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 some consciousness that even though I may be in a dry place there's water somewhere within my reach that there is sustenance in the valley there is a uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, 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 abundance even at times in the valley there's enough somebody say enough there's enough in the valley, and sometimes you and I have to dig as we go. What does it mean for you and I to dig as we go? It means, beloved, that when you are in the valley, you must find a way to cause that experience to be redeemed. You must find ways to allow, as we just read in my reflection, the weeping that Baca in the original language, actually Baca means weeping. So literally this text is saying as you go through the valley of weeping, you're getting an invitation to dig a well. Now if you're familiar with wells, what wells are, they are the Places where water exists deep below the surface. If you are, if you are someone who, who lives out in, in, in the countryside and far away from the coastal spaces, many of us who live in the Bay, we may not fully appreciate this. And even many of us who live uh, on the kind of inland, inland of the Bay, may not fully appreciate that somebody has created a well or spring of water to arrive at your place in space to sustain you even though you may not have personal access to the source of that water. 
Uh-huh. If you live out in the countryside back in the day, you would have to literally dig until you found the water that is under the ground. And I want you to know, beloved, that if you have the strength to dig, you will find what you need as you go deeper into the place that you may not be fully conscious of the sustenance around you. Digging as you go means that you must be willing to allow your life experiences to squeeze lessons into your life that make your valley season redemptive, that make your valley seasons worth going through, that make your seasons of going through tears and grief I will find some value in the journey of the valley. I'm not looking for a valley. Don't get me wrong. Amen. I'm, I'm not looking for places of suffering and places of struggle. But if I find myself in a valley, I will dig as I go. How do you dig? Well, the spiritual disciplines teach us that some things only happen or come out because of prayer and fasting. So there are tools that you must use, especially when you're in the valley. Many of us are only able to use the tools when we're in the church. We're only able to use the tools when uh, uh, the preacher's up preaching and the music is playing. But how many of you know the tools that you need need to be exercised and activated persistently and consistently? Across the whole of your life. Why? Because you will never know when you find yourself in the valley until you get to the valley. And there's nothing worse than trying to jumpstart something that you've not used before you get in some trouble. But I believe that the prayer nights that are called, you ought to find at least some monthly or biweekly or weekly presence in the prayer meeting. Why? So when you get to a valley, it won't be so hard to activate the prayer life that's needed to help you dig as you go. There may be some moments where you don't have joy. You don't have the words to sing the songs and, and you don't have the energy. But I found that when I've been able to rehearse the songs while I'm at my highest point or while I'm not under so much pressure, it's easier than when I get to the valley. If I can't sing it, I can hum it. Lord, have mercy. If I can't shout it from the mountaintop, I can simply pat my feet to the melody in my mind. If I, if I can't remember all the words, I at least know that there's some kind of melody from heaven that can fall and help me get through. The valley season. So my first set of questions today, are you redeeming your baka, your valley experiences? Are you using the valley experience? Because guess what? Everybody's going to have to go through the valley. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them you're going through a valley eventually. Don't, 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 don't get it twisted. Don't think that you can do everything right. Don't think you can do everything wrong. You're going through a valley. There's a valley waiting for you. But guess what? There's redemption waiting for you in that valley as well. God will not allow the valley to destroy you. God will allow the valley to make you. And so what wells are you digging along the way? And can you, can you ask yourself, as I dig these wells, who can benefit from these wells? Because one of the most important things that I found in life is if I dig a well and I keep moving, guess what? Somebody's coming behind me. And my prayer is, God, let me dig the wells that others behind me can drink from. Because if somebody's digging a well with me in mind, how many know somebody else is digging a well with you in mind? Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, dig as you go, dig as you go, dig as you go. The second thing that I believe the text lifts up for us is that you and I, when we go through valleys, it unlocks strength you did not know you had. Somebody holler, my valleys are a strength multiplier. My valleys are a strength multiplier. The text says that they move from strength to strength. 
Now, you know, I've, 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 I've preached and testified about all of the health journeys I've been on to try and get some of these pounds off and get my, 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 my lungs back to pre-COVID, pre-pneumonia, pre-respiratory illness places. And I have found that there are moments in my health journey that I have to depend on the strength that I currently have. To help to unlock the strength that I want to have. That strength does not just uh, come upon you without exercising the strength you currently have within your grasp. I mean, I wish it was possible like uh, Popeye. You know, when Popeye was getting beat up by Brutus. Uh, and he, y'all remember Popeye? Any Popeye folks in here? Some of y'all, I'm not talking about the chicken. Praise God. Some of y'all like, I, what, I never, I, I'm Popeye's. No, I'm not. I'm, there's a cartoon named Popeye's. Uh, did, uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. I don't want to, okay, because, you know, I know it's a new day. Praise God. And it's just things, you know, they just get lost in translation. That's how you know you get old when your illustrations don't land the way they used to. Amen. Nevertheless, I'm glad people know who Popeye is. Popeye, amen, had this relationship with a, 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 a very interestingly formed uh, woman named Olive Oil, who seemed to have the heart of Popeye and Brutus. And Brutus, what, for whatever reason, was just, you know, he was, he was caught up, praise God. He was... He was, he was, he he was, he was whooped. He he just he just had it for 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 this olive. His name olive oil. Lord have mercy, amen. And this, this is a fascinating thing. And Brutus, you know, by his name was a brute. And so he was big and he was, you know, a real heavy handed kind of a fella. And he would use all his game and would get olive oil all into him. And then Popeye was a little scrawny little individual and he didn't have a whole lot of anything. I don't know how it was a competition. And I need to go watch it again because I still don't understand what was going on in those stories. But there was always at the end of the cartoon. Mm -hmm. There was a moment where Popeye said, you know what? I've had enough. And I'm not taking this anymore. He will pull out of his pocket a can of spinach. And he will squeeze the spinach. And the spinach had this routine where it would jump up in the air and find its way into Popeye's mouth. And all of a sudden, Popeye became the foil to Brutus. And, of course, olive oil, as it would happen, would love to, you know, get with Popeye because at least at the end of the episode, he proved to be able to, you know, put hands on Brutus. As much as I wish we had some spinach in our back pocket that you could just pull out when you on your job and, and pull out when you're at your worst and lowest moment, that you could pull out and just all of a sudden get all the strength you need to handle it. How many of you know, most of the time, God will use the strength you have. And by working out those muscles that you already have in your spiritual, physical, emotional, and psychological body, God will use the strength you have to help multiply to the strength you need over the course of your journey. You did not believe you could get through that trauma-filled experience, but aren't you still here? You did not believe that that job was going to be something that could help contribute to the ascending of your career, but you are still here. You didn't believe you could start that business because you was always working for the man every night and day. But now you're out here as an entrepreneur. You didn't believe you could love again, and now your heart is warming back up to the possibilities. Why? Because there's strength in you that God multiplies if you stay on the journey don't retreat when you go through a valley stay on the journey because there's strength being multiplied 
when you go through some things, there's things that are happening in the muscles of your body, of your spirit, of your mind that can only be activated by you going through these things. And beloved, I believe if you can keep going through these things, you will find as you go from place to place and gain strength along the way. Listen, the scripture says strength to strength, place to place until they meet God. Whew, I'm here to tell you today that you got some strength that will stay and last and grow until you meet God in your situation. Oh, I'm here to tell you today, God is waiting for you to run into him. God has an appointment with you in the valley. And all God is saying is just keep going, beloved, because I've given you the strength you need to last until you run into the divine encounter that's waiting for you in the valley. And when you find God in the valley, the last thing the scripture says is that God will not withhold any good thing. To those who walk up rightly before him. And that just means, beloved, that if you can keep going on the journey that you're on and you can keep uh, outlasting the despair and outlasting the struggle, if you can keep digging the wells and get that drink of water, that will just give you another day's journey. If you can keep using the strength that you have to multiply more strength, you will run into God, the God who does not withhold any good thing. Why do you need to, to, to make it through the valley? Because there's a good thing on the end of that valley. There's something. There is a prize uh, that God will allow you to hold on to on the end of that journey. Uh, like I said, you may not always get the victory, but on the other side of the journey, you'll have more faith. Uh, on the other side of the journey, you'll have more healing. Uh, on the other side of the journey, you'll have more knowledge about God. Uh, that if God did it before... God can do it again. If God brought me out the last time, I know God will bring me through the next time. If God caused me to get victory this time, then I know even if I suffer defeat the next time, victory is on the way. And now I know that I mentioned that all of us may not be able to carry no spinach in our back pocket every time. But how many know there are a few times in your life where God will let that spinach called the Holy Ghost? Uh, get activated in your life uh, uh, and give you a miracle. Somebody holler a miracle. I'm so glad that God is a miracle working God. Uh, I may not always experience a miracle, uh, but that is not what a miracle is intended to be. Uh, I won't get a miracle every time, uh, but how many know every once in a while, God will wink at me. Uh, God will wink at you. Uh, and God will say, God, beloved, I'm getting ready to do something for you that nobody else can do. Uh, I'm getting ready to open a door that no one can shut. Uh, I'm getting ready to heal your body in a way that will confound a doctor. Uh, I'm getting ready to touch your mind in a way that will confound a psychologist. Uh, I'm getting ready to put your family back together in a way that will make the MFT start scratching their head. Uh, I'm getting ready to help you in your schoolwork in a way that the professors will try to figure out how did you get that done? Uh, why? Because I'm looking for a miracle. Uh, I expect the impossible. I believe that God can do anything but fail. But I just got to keep on walking. I got to keep on living. I got to keep on pushing through the valley. And as I go through the valley, I'm going to make it a well. I'm going to make it a place of springs of living water. Not only just for myself but also for the people who are in the valley with me. God, help me to always be mindful that the wells I dig are not just for myself, but the wells I dig are for the students I teach. The wells I dig are for the family members that are still struggling in their addiction. The wells that I dig are for the communities that are still struggling with violence. The wells that I dig are for the Palestinian loved ones who are experiencing a genocide. The wells that I dig are for the Haitians who are dealing with all kind of political upheaval. The wells that I dig are for the incarcerated. God help me to make it a well. 
make it aware. How many know God gives enough for all who would drink from this well? Jesus said it like this, I am the living water. If anyone thirst, let them drink from me. How I many know that we are, I'm glad to serve a living, walking, breathing well. Woo! That means wherever, wherever I go, I got a, I got a portable source of strength. I got a portable source of sustenance. I got a portable source of enough. Come on, stand with me, everybody. Let's prepare to pray. Grab the hand of the person next to you if you don't mind. Make it a well. Make it a well. Make it a well. Make it a well. God, I and we are your people who find ourselves caught in the in-between. We see the place of Zion where you are. We see the work that you are doing. And yet, God, as we make our journey, we find ourselves at times in desert places, places of scarcity, places of struggle, places of despair. But I want to say thank you, God, that even while we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though we walk through the valley of abandonment, the valley of rejection, the valley of weeping, God, in every valley, we know by your promise that there is a well. There is what you have provided for us enough to sustain ourselves. So God, I pray as we walk through this season of the both ends, the season of the struggle and the victory, the season of the joy and the grief, the season of the desert and the spring places. God, I pray that you will remind us to dig a well as we go. Remind us, oh God, to tap into the strength multiplier. Remind us, oh God, to be people who are able to redeem every experience every journey and look for your activity at work and so god i pray for the love that we have for our neighbor i'm interceding with the one that i'm touching today give them what they need give them hope give them strength give them power give them anointing give them what they need for the facing of this hour and now lift your hands where you're standing. God, it's me, O oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister or my brother. But it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, Lord. Somebody say, I need you. I need your love. I need your peace. I need your power. I need your strength. And so I pray today, God, that you will give us what we need. God, so we can be your people, your faithful people in this hour. And we'll say thank you, God, for all these things that we know are coming our way. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, hug two or three people. Tell them, make it a well today. Tell them that, make it a well.